seminar. This is the last one in October. Uh, th next week, Deb will be uh, speaking on uh, some work he's been doing uh, for the railroad settlement at Bridges. And in two weeks, uh, we'll have the editor, first uh, lecture on uh, the editor uh, of ICT to explain about uh, better scientific writing and report writing. And, and then she'll speak again at the end of November. And I think in three weeks from now, it's Brian Hill who's speaking. So today we have uh, Maziar Moavini uh, and uh, Professor Tatumler's work here on the image and enhanced image uh, analyzing machine. Uh, he's been working on uh, various uh, research projects related to granular materials for railroads and highway applications. And uh, he's been here for three years, ten months. And he uh, told me just, uh, just a second ago. So uh, he's looking forward to completing his thesis relatively soon. Uh, so let's uh, welcome Maziar on his presentation. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, for the Kent Seminar Series, I'm going to talk about uh, aggregate size and shape evaluation using enhanced aggregate image analyzer and segmentation techniques in the field. Uh, I got involved in this research project almost one year ago with Professor Tutumler. Uh, the funding for this project is provided by uh, Association of American Railroad, Transportation Technology Center, and uh, BNSF Railway. Uh, the outline of pr my presentation includes a brief background about aggregate imaging and its application in the area of uh, pavement and railroad engineering. Uh, I will explain the objective and the research task about this uh, research project that we are uh, involved right now. After that, I'm going to give you an update about some hardware and software improvements that we have done on our new version of uh, aggregate image analyzer. Then I will talk about some image segmentation techniques that uh, we are going to use. Uh, uh, I'm hearing my voice, I guess. So, um, and then image uh, segmentation techniques that we have developed to use in the field. Uh, I'll describe a brief case study that we did to verify our methods, and then I will summarize and conclude my presentation with some acknowledgments. Uh, so, according to what we all know, uh, a major part of uh, flexible and uh, rigid pavements uh, is uh, unbound or aggregate granular material. Uh, more than 85% of uh, Cement concrete and almost more than 90% 90, 90 of the asphalt concrete is uh, unbound material. So understanding the behavior and the properties of this material is really important for us since it will affect the performance uh, significantly. Uh, one of the properties of the unbound material is its shape properties. So um, we all probably know that uh, there are some key physical shape properties of an aggregate that will include the performance. These key physical properties include angularity, surface texture, and shape or form of the aggregate. Uh, when we are talking about angularity, we talk about <coughs> some uh, ir irregularities at the mac macro level on the surface of the aggregate. And when we are talking about surface texture, we are talking about micro level uh, or the roughness of the aggregate. Of course, volume and surface area is also two important parameters of each single aggregate particle. There are several methods in the literature that they have tried to differentiate between a crushed versus uncrushed rock or a rough versus a smooth rock. There are some visual methods. For example, you just have an operator. person will inspect the aggregate particles and give a number to each aggregate based on a system that, for example, developed by uh, in 1941. Uh, so the first question that come to my mind, come to everybody's mind, is that this method is very subjective. Each person may have a different judgment how they want to assign these numbers to each particle. So we want more consistent and repeatable and uh, less subjective methods. There are some ASTM standards that will define, uh, will focus on each of these properties. For example, ASTM D41. <coughs> 
4791 uh, use uh, the caliper for defining the number of flat and elongated particles. Uh, um, the ASTM D5821 will uh, uh, focus on the number of fracture faces of each rock, and so you just uh, count the number of fracture faces that you have, and then at the end, define how much per the percentage of the weight of your sample is fractured, and then the particle index test and uncompacted airboard taste will try to indirectly uh, relate the surface texture property with the airboard of the sample. So the more rough particles you have, the higher airboard you will have in your sample. Um, imaging technique with all the advancement that we have in uh, the cameras and image processing techniques, uh, people have used this method to also take the pictures from the rock and analyze the images and take some quantified values for each rock to be able to compare different rocks with each other. We have developed this machine in almost 12, 12 years ago in our lab, um, uh, and it was uh, the, innovated by Professor Tutumar and Chetana Rao, his PhD student. Um, this machine has three black and white camera and take monochrome images of each particle on a conveyor that pass with the three inch per second speed and then uh, store the images in the hard disk and then there are some algorithms that uh, analyze each images for defining their shape properties. This is the environmental, uh, the, 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 the software interface of that uh, equipment is in LabVIEW 2006 and as I said we have three orthogonal views of each particle and then we have the algorithm to al calculate the shape properties. Um, Flat and elongated ratio is the first parameter that we defined. Simply is the longest dimension over the shortest dimension of each rock from each view will define that and then uh, calculate it for all the three views of the aggregate. Um, angularity index is defined as uh, the how, how the change in angles around the surface of the aggregate will happen. We will take 24 points all around the particle and we're basically trying to estimate the particle with inside the polygon and then uh, we will uh, ca uh, measure each angle at each vertex and then we calculate how the angle will different when we move around the particle and then we plot the, the frequ uh, uh, frequency occurrence of these, each of these changing angles with 10 degrees in intervals and the angularity is defined as a summation over this uh, uh, frequency and degree intel was divided by number of points that we have around the particle. So simply for a stink circle uh, shape uh, particle, this angularity value is zero and then we have different values. The more crush uh, rock that you have, the more change in angle you have and then we calculate that for uh, all the three views and uh, uh, average it over the area of the particle. This is a, s a typical plot that we show when we want to uh, show the result of the angularity index. We can see, for example, a crushed stone versus a gravel one, it's more on the right of the side of the plot, which are higher values for the angularity versus uh, a gravel which falls in the left side. Um, for surface texture index, we have a, a method for image filtering. We call it erosion and dilation. It's a simple and popular method in uh, image binarization. Um, mm, uh, it, uh, so the, base, the basic idea is that the more rough your particle is, the more uh, area that you lose, you lose when you do the erosion, uh, the cycle of erosion and dilations. Uh, so basically we judge based on the area that we lose after several erosion and dilation filtering <coughs> on the binary image, and then we will divide it over again, calculate it for all the three views of the aggregate and divide it over the area and then define the surface texture index for each particle. We have scanned more than 20,000 particles uh, during the last year in several pool fund and nationwide studies. This uh, table shows that the ranges that we have came up that shows that how you want to judge about the different values that we get out of this image uh, results. So for example, if you are dealing with an uncrushed gravel, you are expecting to get some values within 250 or 350 with uh, angularity index and less than 1.2 between uh, and over 0 0.5 for the surface te texture. And then when you go to more crushed and angular particle like crushed, gr crushed granite, you will uh, get close to 600 and for your surface texture values you get close to 3. 
we have done a lot of studies to see how these properties will affect the different material properties. For example, unbound aggregate resilient modulus, uh, Professor Tutumaras and his PhD student, Tong Yang Pan, uh, have done this uh, study and they show that the more angularity index, the more crushed gravel you have, the higher resilient modulus you will see. And they also were able to establish good correlation values. Um, in terms of field performance, uh, TF, TPF uh, pool fund study in 2005 uh, was uh, mm, uh, able to show that how this uh, angularity index will correlate to the field performance of the mixture. They sent almost 16 mixture uh, type of mixture to here, and we uh, scanned the aggregate, and then they they uh, they built some test section in NCAT test section in Auburn, and they uh, put load on that, and they will see how the performance will work in terms of rub rub depth, and how they correlate to the shape properties. You can see. Uh, flat and elongated ratio increases, you are expecting more rod depth, angularity index increase less, and the, sa the same the surface texture will increase, you are expecting to get uh, less deformation. Uh, but what I talked, uh, was a brief literature, but right now in our research project, we are trying to bring this technology, imaging technology, to the field. So if you want to build an image analyzer in the lab, it probably would be very uh, cost effective and we have to train the operators. But if you want to just bring it to the field so that people with a simple uh, uh, like a commercial camera can take some pictures and be able to analyze the images of the rocks. So in order to achieve that objective, we had to go through some tasks. The first step was to upgrade our machine to, to include more advanced uh, parts in terms of hardware and software to to correlate it to the field, because we always want to build everything on all the database that we had before. Um, and then the second step is to go ahead and uh, um, investigate different imaging techniques to be able uh, to find uh, which one will work best with the, f uh, the, f uh, the field images, and then at the end, put everything together as a hardware and a software package available for people in the field to use. Uh, according to what I mentioned, this, this project is sponsored by two uh, railroad companies, and so we right now we are focusing on the ballast and the railroad uh, ballast uh, sections. Uh, we will just uh, take the high resolution images of the ballast sections, and we want to threshold or segment those images and isolate each particles out of the image. I have a picture here that visually show what we have in mind for this project. So we have, you have a picture of the cut section. You will uh, uh, crop some part of that image, and you want to do some segmentation techniques on that image, and then find the boundaries between the rock and extract each rock out of that image and try to do the same part of analysis that we do in the lab on each single particle, all in one shot together. Uh, Again, for example, if this is a cut section of your ballast, railroad ballast, and you want to, <laughs> visually you can see, I mean, for the people who go to the field, visually it's, uh, uh, an expert engineer can judge that, okay, how fall is this uh, ballast and uh, if it really needs to be changed or uh, it is degraded a lot. But for the machine to learn it and uh, give us some uh, quantitative value that are consistent and repeatable, that's a challenging work that we are right now following. Uh, so as I mentioned, the first step was to improve our machine. So we went back and uh, tried to focus on each part of this machine and try to upgrade it in, uh, uh, with some um, uh, uh, available uh, advanced uh, hardware. Uh, for example, in terms of light, we can see in, uh, instead of tree light, we added four LED lights and the dimmer control to be able to um, Mm, regulate the intensity of the mm -hmm. lights around the, in the, around the rock. Or for, uh, in terms of the software, we also went with uh, advanced thresholding method in LabVIEW and uh, uh, more user-friendly interface. This is another picture that shows how we are arranging the light to be able to minimize the shadows around the rock and to be able to get a very good image uh, from three views of the rock. Uh, camera, uh, we were working with a 640 by 480 pixels camera, the maximum ap aperture ratio 1.4. Right now we increased it to a 1.3 megapixel camera and um, higher level of aperture so we can 
uh, regulate the amount of light that goes through the sensor uh, more properly. We have more control over these factors in terms of monochrome images and getting the image with one channel. We are working with color images, three channels. One of the challenges that we had with the old image analyzer was that when we had a dark particle and a black background, we had some difficulties to detect this particle out of the background. So in the top part, you can see when you have a white particle on a black background, the monochrome image is a good option because there is a good enough contrast between these two uh, surfaces. So as you can see, the grayscale histogram show, show, shows the bimodal behavior, which shows that you can uh, easily separate these two uh, parts from each other. You have a good contrast, in other words. But when you have a dark particle, uh, the histogram is unimodal and it's challenging to find a threshold value that can separate these two uh, 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 parts from each other. So that's why we shifted to work, instead of working in one plane, just black and white, go ahead and work in three RGB representation of that image and uh, represent it with uh, red, green, and blue channels, and then work in each one separately, and then uh, compose all of them together. So uh, you can see we, we uh, selected the blue background. So it makes sense. Probably we are not going to deal with the blue rock, hopefully. But, uh, uh, but I mean, for example, this method, when you put a black rock on that, we can achieve the image with three channels, and then you have three histogram values, and we can uh, go ahead to the RGB cube and find three threshold values and uh, do a better job in terms of generating the binary image, which is the first step in our an analysis. Uh, in terms of the higher resolution of the camera, uh, you can see we are able to detect more details around the uh, edge of the rock. Uh, the bottom image shows that uh, 640 by 480 pixels and then almost each pixel will be replaced by four pixels and you will be able to achieve a, a sharper image of the edge which help us to uh, uh, define the property more accurately. Um, again, RGB versus uh, grayscale. This is the performance of the machine to, to provide a binary image with different rocks with white, uh, different colors, pink, gray, light brown, white, black. You can see it's pretty much doing a good job to uh, select and uh, detect the binary image and providing the shape properties. This is the user interface. As I mentioned, it is really easy to learn. Recently, we uh, uh, delivered two of these equipments to BNSF and uh, Tensor Corporation, and we also provide them some training. So they, right now, they know how to use this machine, and they have already started to scan uh, different sources of aggregate in Georgia. Uh, this is a brief uh, table that shows uh, the improvement that we have, the old system versus the new system. Um, one of the things that I need to mention in the old system, we had a laser sensor that should detect the particle when it's passing over the conveyor. But, uh, and then it was sending a signal to the three cameras to take the picture at the right time. But in the new system, we are using the live video f with uh, 30 frames per second, and then the cameras automatically will um, uh, detect the object at the right time on the middle of the frame and then uh, take the image. I have a brief, uh, I have a, like a small uh, short movie here and I hope that it works, that it shows how this machine works basically. So we put the rocks one by one on a conveyor. It's passed uh, fr in front of three cameras and then you have something that the aggregates will fall on that and then you have the software control you can see as the rocks will pass, uh, uh, the machine will detect them and then provide the binary image uh, uh, in, in the other window. And then it will save all the images in an Excel file, and you will be able to process them later and do some statistical analysis on the distribution of the properties. You can do even go fast, like a lot of rocks probably. Uh, in an hour, you would have a good uh, efficiency. Um, and then, so what I talked uh, was, again, was in the lab. But in the field, if you want to go into the field and uh, repeat all of this process, you need a package. You need a hardware package. You need a DSLR camera. <coughs> uh, we did, in our study, we used a 15 megapixel with 
18 uh, to 55 millimeter focal length and we, uh, the technology of the sensor is different in this uh, camera um, and then we use, a, we use a tripod, a flashlight and a, a blue piece of paper and a calibration bias for calibrating the images. Uh, we have done uh, some uh, preliminary results like outside in the field just for the start we are taking the samples of the aggregate, spread all of them <coughs> on a blue piece of paper and take the image with this camera and then try to analyze that image uh, to that uh, this is the first step before really be able to go to the final goal and achieve uh, and analyze the image in the field. Um, this, the method that we are using for, again, extracting the particle out of the background is a graph, to graph cut segmentation method based on Markov random field methods. Very simply, if you have a nine pixel image here, um, use this uh, algorithm to basically change the image to a graph. So each pixel in your image represents a node in the graph. And then you, the user will define a background and a foreground. So you will pick a couple of uh, pixels and define them as a background and a foreground. So this is one of the deficiencies of this method that it needs help from the user. It's not completely automatic. But since we are going to do the analysis later, we can use this uh, uh, method for several rocks together. Um, and then how these uh, pixels are connecting to each other relates uh, the, uh, like the, the, the thicker the line that you see is, it shows that uh, the higher probability that it belongs to the surface or the aggregate, and then uh, we basically assign some weights to each of these nodes. And after that, we need to find the best cut that can differentiate the pixels that belong to the background and the foreground with the maximum flow, minimum cut optimization uh, uh, problem, and then. We can see, for example, for this image, we find a, a, a minimum cut. And then after that, we just assign 0 to uh, the black pixels, uh, the, the, the pixels that belong to the foreground, and 1 to the pixels that belong to the uh, background. And then you basically are done. You have provided your binary image. In summary, how it's work, the user input, and then the foreground mm -hmm. and background separation, and then the binary image uh, yeah, uh, generation. After we, we found the binary image, we need to extract each particle out of the rest of the particles. We do it by checking a pixel by pixel. So you have like a pixel F over there. You want to see what's going on around the neighbor, neighborhood pixels. You go ahead and check the pixels and see each, each of them each is 1 or 0. It belongs to the background or this belongs to the particles. So F shows that it right now belongs to the uh, particles and the like. Uh, and then the black one uh, shows that it's belonged to the background. And then you just repeat this process for the rest of the images until you completely find your location and uh, the your location of your rock. And you do this for the, all of the rocks. And that's how you extract each of the particles out of the image with a bunch of rocks. And then you can input these images in your algorithm and then calculate the shape properties. Again, this is the summary of the method that we are using for uh, uh, image segmentation in the field right now. Um, before go ahead and implement this method in the field, we had to make sure that uh, this method is going to give us the same values as we are getting without image analyzer. So we simply uh, took an image of a rock and a calibration ball with the camera of our machine, but we applied this segmentation process on that to separate this. Uh, this uh, uh, two object and then calculate the shape properties for that, and then did the same. Uh, uh, for some reason, it doesn't show the table here, but um, we did the same for the rocks, and then uh, we were able to record the same values both of the methods. Um, uh, after that, we have, after we uh, validated that method, we, we in the lab we we went into the field and tried to do a, a, a field study and uh, implement this method there. So we were planning to go ahead and find the railroad ballast sections and take some samples from different uh, levels of the ballast. For example, top uh, and the middle level and the bottom of the tie, and then take those samples, sp spread them on that. Spread them on the blue sheet and then take the um, image and then analyze that image. So we 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 had a field trip to uh, Holly Spring in Mississippi, south of 
Memphis, uh, we went to visit one of the BNSF tracks, then and, uh, the location of the um, uh, sampling was uh, between mileposts uh, 534.7 and 532.8, almost six miles uh, 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 south of uh, Holly Spring, um, and this was close to the road also. How we uh, were sampling is that we just find the shoulder of the ballast, and then we try to collect our samples from the top, uh, 10 inch below the top and 16 inch below the uh, below the uh, tie. So as you see, we were uh, put the aggregates on a on that uh, background and then try to take the images with the DSLR camera and the tripod. So you can see when you take the uh, particles from the top, they are big, and then when you when you go down, they start to get a smaller and uh, under the load, and which is basically a degradation versus the depth that the more load that you uh, have under the train, uh, it starts to crush the aggregates uh, f uh, over time, and they start to get smaller. Um, this is the analysis results with the two methods that we did. So we <coughs> took to those rock to our lab and analyzed the images with the two methods. <coughs> And we were able to record the same trends between the two, uh, uh, two methods of uh, analysis. Uh, so for the angularity and surface texture index, we were, we were able to record that when we are going down uh, to the, uh, we, we, are, we are going deeper, we are increasing the values uh, both for surface texture and angularity, and the, the, the maximum dimension of the rocks are increasing, are decreasing, which makes sense. Um, <coughs> what was really interesting in this uh, study that uh, uh, we were like maybe like a general belief maybe is that when your rocks uh, start to uh, get old and degrade, maybe their uh, roughness or the angularity may uh, decrease. But it was not the case in the field because uh, we were able to see that they are increasing the surface tension and angularity. So one explanation for this. Uh, uh, result is that when the rocks get smaller and they break, they start to uh, provide new fresh surfaces, and then uh, so the the fresh surfaces are more rough and more angular. The result of this study we have uh, has, uh, put it in a paper and already has been submitted in TR. We are going to present the result in uh, DC2. Um, so in summary, uh, we could learn from. Uh, this uh, study that aggregate shear properties are important factors that affect the pavement and railroad performance. Um, we, we introduced the second generation of uh, aggregate image analyzer uh, with a lot of improvements uh, over the uh, old system that we have designed and manufactured uh, in all in our university here. Uh, we uh, we uh, check a couple of image segmentation techniques and apply them to some high resolution images that we capture in the field uh, to evaluate the shape properties. Our case study shows that this method is working right now. However, we are still going through the direction that we can, uh, without even sampling, just take the image mm -hmm. of the cut sections and try to uh, and get some quantitative values out of those uh, images. And then this method, uh, will help us to, um, uh, in terms of, will help us for selecting <coughs> the up, uh, good sources of aggregate and the good qu control quality control assurance technique in the aggregate quarries uh, for the production. Right now, the aggregate quarries, the only uh, limitation that they have in their production is the gradation. So they don't have any control over the crusher, how the crusher will break the rocks and. Uh, how angular or how rough is their products. If we can provide this uh, software and hardware package for them, they can just, uh, and then some training, they can go and do these things in the quarries, and then uh, uh, we'll be able to control their products um, uh, more, much better. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, Shengnan Wang, graduate student from uh, Beckman Institute and Electrical Engineering Department. John Hart, uh, the senior engineer, senior research engineer from Beckman Institute, and Professor Narendra Ahuja uh, from Electrical Engineering Department to uh, help in this study. 
uh, Dave Davis from AARR and Hank Lee from BNSF they will uh, uh, help us in providing the funding for this research and I highly appreciate them. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, finish my presentations and I would be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Uh, we just actually delivered them, so they haven't started to uh, do any kind of a study or something, but we will. We are planning to share our data and do kind of research collaboration with them. So this is uh, a two-dimensional imaging of the aggregates. So this is with an assumption that a two-dimensional shape analysis gives a reliable estimate of the three-dimensional shape. Is that are you talking about the field or in the no. lab? Any the the image ones in the field, maybe field or in the laboratory. So in the in the lab we are working with three views of an aggregate particles. But okay. in the field, as you mentioned, we are working with one view right now. Okay. We are just take the image with one camera, one view, and everything is in two D right now in the field. Later on, we are planning to use kind of a stereo images or more cameras to be able to get some idea about the 3D yes, shape because, of the particles too. Yeah, because when you are putting the aggregate on a surface, it is lying on a comfortable, you know, with the lowest potential, yes. so that the, the true shape may, may be, may need to be evaluated in a different angle than the angle. Part that's true, say. that's yeah. exactly true. So and uh, I have another question. The texture index, uh, we do, you do by erosion dilation analysis, yes. and then for that you take a Structural element, exactly. Structural, structural element, element dimension for here. neighborhood. Uh, yeah. Detection. So, but then if I change the structural element dimension, I will get a different value. Exactly. And in exactly. fact, the angularity and texture has a very thin line. That how much is texture and how much is angularity? Yes, exactly. Uh, so, so, how to determine the number of structural elements should I choose for erosion dimension? Yes, actually the compre comprehensive study already has been done on this, your question in the Tony Young Pan dissertation, the former PhD you know, who actually uh, originally developed this method. Uh, they have tried different structural elements to go ahead and do some kind of analysis of variance to see how efficient each of these uh, structural elements will do in terms of differentiating uh, rough versus smooth or crushed versus <coughs> an uncrushed gravel. And then they optimize the algorithm based on the output of that study and then they developed in this method. So it's kind yes. of in the professor's first point that he made, you're using planar images to represent 3D and you showed at one point a cutaway mm -hmm. of the railroad and you were going to attempt to capture a planar image there. Mm -hmm. And he's saying if you drop your aggregate on the blue sheet in the field and you're taking your base image with your reference, your ball reference, that planar image is now actually in the horizontal plane, but your cut is in the vertical plane. Yes. How do you go from the horizontal to the vertical plane? Yes, yeah. So uh, the, the idea is right now, this is the first step. The first step we are trying to bring this method in the field. So we are taking the samples and want to take the image of a bunch of aggregates together. But the, the final objective of this project that in the, the plane of the cut section that we want to do analysis on that, we have some uh, ideas and we have some plans for that that uh, use some kind of watershed segmentation or some kind of other methods to be able to define the rocks that we can see all of the uh, dimension out of the pile of the rocks. Now the, ro the rocks that are hiding uh, behind each other they are almost impossible to capture. So, and then, so it's just rotate everything on the zero degree to 90 degree. That's the method that we want to follow and extract the particles uh, and the cut sections. That we, the particle that we can see all around their uh, edges and all of their view in the, in the cut section. I'm not sure if that answered your question well. or not. Somewhat, but I think simple rotation is going to be difficult because as stated, if you drop an aggregate, it's going to have a tendency to land on a preferred surface. Yeah. So that preferred surface is going to be captured in a horizontal planar image, for example, but completely disguised.
skies in the vertical. So it's going to be very difficult to go from one to the other, I think. Mm, that's true, but at the end, we all just want to judge and uh, compare one section with the other section. We are not looking for exact values for each of rock that just want to do some kind of decision of those. We want to just compare one section, <coughs> the graded section versus the new section. Any kind of va uh, quantitative value will help us rather than somebody go there and see that with the human eye and not a judge. So, <laughs> yes. I mean, ideally, we don't want a sample. Sorry, I'm John Hunter. This is John Hunter. He's also involved in the project. Um, <laughs> we actually don't want a sample. We just want to look at the uh, section and make an evaluation from that. Um, the particles are randomly placed there. Obviously, we just want to pick out those few that are on the surface so we can see the whole outline that are included by the front. Uh, placing, them, placing them on the map is, is introducing caveats that they always fall on the flat surface. Um, that eventually we'll take that part out and just take it through the process. I have a follow-up question. Uh, uh, I remember that when Hank Lees was visiting, he was saying something that uh, Professor Kitum especially was very much excited about, and I was thinking of what's the feasibility of that. What Hank was saying is that when there is a maintenance train going, he was saying that if there is a tra uh, there is, there is, there is a way to put cameras to at 45 degree angles or something, then you can get like isometric kind of views instead of just taking a planar view of the cut section. And he was saying that analysis of that may give some kind of a 3D. Is that possible to do in right. analysis? Yeah, that's what I'm here mentioned about stereo. Okay. So you take two cameras, like you have two eyes, and you look at two very different. Is there a way to match the exact aggregates from this image and that image? Yeah. Yeah. There is. I mean, computer vision is a big problem, but I had, a, I had a question about your surface texture comment. Uh, I didn't catch, I, I can't remember how to, you did the calculation, but you did some kind of erosion dilation. And, uh, did, did you use the same structural element for the different sizes? No, it actually depends to the size. So the, st uh, the, the structural elements is the same. But the number of erosion and cycles, uh, the erosion cycles of erosion and dilation depends to the size of the aggregate. So is there some kind of uh, size dependent value that you're introducing? I mean, my question is, if I have two different particle or two different particle size of the exact same aggregate, would I actually come up with the same surface texture anyway, despite this, your conclusion that you made the conclusion that I'm not convinced it's so uh, we will be in the same range if you have like we are not again talking about each party because we are talking about a lot of digitization error uh, like a lighting yeah. condition when you took two images of each even if you have one particle you took two <coughs> image of that particle those two images are not equal because the pixel values any kind of light change any kind of like Correct. Let's say so all that's if you exactly think that right. they are everything is exactly the same you have a big particle versus a small particle the number of erosion and dilations are different with the big particles versus the small particles. So at the end, we are trying to normalize them based on their size, so that at the end, we are going to have the same ranges for both particles, which are from the same source. So would, the surface would you expect the surface texture to be the same? Within the same range. If we have a normal distribution for like 10 times, we are doing that randomly, and then at the end, we were expecting that the mean values would be the same, and they are not significantly different statistically. We are always talk with the language of statistics here. Uh, can I can I realize the question like this? If we have different kind of aggregate, like say granite and limestone, but exactly same size and exactly same shape, do we have a different surface texture or the same surface texture? Yes, texture? we I have guess. we have the different <coughs> surface texture for them. Limestone versus granite are yeah. different materials. They are, I see, but they are the same. Now they are the same. They have the same size and the same shape properties. Theoretical question, exactly. Now the same structural uh, variation, like same. So you have to get the same with this formula, the same surface <coughs> texture or the different surface texture. 
we will get the same. If, if you, those two particles, those two objects are exactly identical in terms of their surface roughness and the aggregality, you will get this almost the same value within a, like a reasonable deviation. Because I, 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 again, there are some digitiza digitization errors that, it, that will affect your results a little bit. But again, the range will be the same for both of the particles. Any other questions? They have done a lot of study in t uh, for the repeatability and uh, uh, consistency of this method. You have like bunch of samples. You uh, like I like, try to scan them several times and see how they different. The COV values are around 10 to 15 percent. That's what the COV values in terms of like volume computation or angularity we are expecting to get. <coughs> Uh, the old machine, the new machine is less than that because we are more accurate. <coughs> okay, thanks, Nazir. You're welcome. <laughs>